as if the March 2020 declaration had ended and he issued a new one. It wasn't until as the case progressed that it became apparent that that March 2020 declaration never expired and as of today is still in existence. The day I filed my brief, the governor extended it yet again. And it's true that the declaration in and of itself doesn't seem to impose a burden on anyone. That's why I, I, I grudgingly accept the issue of whether someone has standing to challenge the declaration in and of itself as a mere declaration. And let's not kid ourselves. I think it's been publicly stated by the administration that the only reason this declaration still is in existence is to get federal funding, I think, for Medicare reimbursement or something like that. It's, it's a funding mechanism, but why that is still in existence. If it was just a declaration that's just sitting there, not doing anything, that's one thing. But then what flows from that declaration is what's important. So if the declaration is we're in a pandemic, and this pandemic is COVID, okay, I, I, you know, I'm not going to be so, um, so bold as to say, no, we're not in a pandemic. If that's what the governor says, that's what the, the Department of Health says, I, I, I can understand that. But the nature and extent of that pandemic, whether or not there's a new variant that constitutes a new pandemic, the, all of the allegations that the hospitals are being overrun, that, the, that uh, uh, certain things that were happening, the doomsday scenarios that the governor set forth in his, in his declaration of emergency, which, by the way, never came true. The hospitals were never overrun. They never opened a field hospital like they said they were going to open it in, in the, um, the original declaration. A lot of those things didn't come to pass. And the state just ignores that. They just pretend that that wasn't even in the executive order. More importantly, it was then that declaration that is, is used as the justification for the second executive order imposing the mask mandate. See, I issued a declaration for a pandemic. Now I get to do whatever I want. So I can't, I can't we cannot, as plaintiffs, simply attack the mask mandate. We, we, we attack the entire process by which that mask mandate came about. But you're even in agreement of what the process was. First, there was a general declaration of emergency, and then there was a mask mandate. So well, no well, questions there. But, but even that, Judge, if you look at the original declaration, or I'm sorry, the, 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 I understand that you have concerns about what the effectiveness of the, the legality of the declaration and whether or not they should be put to effect. But can't the court decide that on a motion for judgment or a plea? If there's no question that this mandate went in, this emergency was declared, it was extended, I'm going to call it three. Judge, we had a seven day hearing. We, we, we presented various conflicting facts for Your Honor that Your Honor took considerable time and effort to listen to, to review, and issue a decision on. <laughs> we did spend seven days arguing legal, of the, the legality of the executive order. We argued seven days the factual underpinnings of those executive orders. And Your Honor made, made certain factual findings in that. And, 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 under the context of a preliminary injunction motion, where you gave greater deference to the state, given the nature of the preliminary injunction proceedings, where the burden was a heavy burden on us. Well, now we're in the reverse situation. Now you have to accept everything that was, all the facts that were presented as true. And if you accept those facts as true, the state had no basis to issue, the, the government had no basis to issue a mask mandate, because masks don't work and are harmful to children. In fact, Your Honor found that masks are harmful to children. So we did prove that part of our case. You simply found that the harm to children was outweighed by the benefit that the state claimed masks provided. We stand here today and wholly reject that. Um, 
There's a recent decision, Your Honor. I, I, I was debating whether to file a brief. Question, the questions, in fact, are the same as were decided in the motion for preliminary injunction. If you just want to trial on the merits on a permanent injunction, is that right? Correct, Your Honor. A declaratory judgment and potentially whether or not Your Honor would have to issue a permanent injunction in conjunction with a declaratory judgment, I think is a debatable legal point that I don't think we need to get to at this point. If you declare that it was illegal for the governor to issue the mandate because there was no factual underpinning for it, whether you have to issue an injunction telling the judge not to, the governor not to do it again, I think there's some discretion that the court would have, whether the governor would abide by your declaratory judgment. So I don't know that that really is relevant to the motion that's before you right now. But we do have the right to have a full trial hearing, not the rushed hearing we did in the preliminary injunction, not with the heightened burden on us as part of that preliminary injunction hearing. We have the right to our discovery. I didn't think it was rushed. Well, Judge, there were many days where I got stacks feet, two or three feet high of dashboard material that had one day to review. That's true. There were a lot of questions that I had, which given the time constraints about the process by which the Department of Health, for example, reviewed the mask mandate, their mask regulation, that I didn't get the benefit of really delving into with Dr. McDonald, that I think discovery will give us that opportunity to flesh out. Discovery is going on? So, yes, Judge, as Your Honor may be aware, initially the state moved to state discovery. Let me back up. Shortly after Your Honor's decision in November, we filed a petition for writ of cert in the Supreme Court. In opposition to that motion, or that petition, the state argued that we hadn't started discovery yet, and that's basically our fault because the facts hadn't been properly fleshed out with the court. So immediately after I got that opposition motion from the state, I sent discovery in early December to both the governor and the Department of Health with interrogatories and a request for production of documents. The state then moved to stay that discovery. They moved before Your Honor. Your Honor denied that motion. They then moved before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court denied that motion. It denied that motion in conjunction with denying both our petition for writ of cert and the state filed their own petition for writ of cert. The clear implications, I would suggest, Your Honor, from the Supreme Court were, as I stated in my opposition to the state's petition, when courts are hearing things on an emergency basis, facts get jumbled. And I cited the example of Justice Sotomayor in the Supreme Court where there was a discussion about the OSHA mask mandate. And in that colloquy with the court, Judge Sotomayor got her facts wrong. She asserted that 100,000 kids had been hospitalized because of COVID. It was a clear mistake. Now, whether it was a mistake, an innocent mistake, or if it was something that was presented in the hearing, it was widely discussed in legal journals about how the Supreme Court justice could have gotten something that important wrong. And I pointed out to the Supreme Court, that's what happens when you have rushed hearings and preliminary injunctions. Sometimes the facts don't get clearly delineated. And I can't tell you, Your Honor, that that was why the Supreme Court denied the state's motion to stay discovery, but they did. They denied both our petitions, sent it back down here, denied the stay of discovery, and the clear implication I got from that from the Supreme Court is they wanted a full hearing on the merits of this case so that it doesn't happen again. So that we're not going to be before Your Honor next fall when something else like this happens. And again, to get to the mootness issue. 
probably still start to be troubled by the fact. So where are we with discovery? Is going to be all set? So I, I, so, um, I submitted the discovery. I got my initial responses about uh, two or three weeks ago. Um, many of the responses were objected to on privilege grounds. Some of the responses I, I would submit were non-responsive to my request. Uh, but we've agreed um, to stay any further proceedings on discovery pending the decision on this motion. Uh, quite frankly, just for um, time constraints, I'm not going to be prepared for this motion, preparing a motion to compel and going to go that argument before another justice. We thought, I, I, I agree with the, the state that it would be better to, to get your honor's ruling on this motion first before we went down that road. But there's still pen, it's still pending discovery. It's still out there. We still, we still have a lot of questions um, about hospitalizations, for example. The claim that there were all the things. Kind of whether or not the governor is reliant on facts, whether or not those facts are true. Correct. Anything else? With regard to the facts. Well, yes, because you, you, open, you all agree on what the procedure is, right? What happened? The governor did this on this day, the governor did this on this day, you wrote a challenge on this day, right? I, I, I wish I could say yes, Your Honor, but I've been stating since the beginning of this case the governor relied on three things. He didn't just rely on the Emergency Powers Act, the Management Act. He relied on his inherent authority under Article 9 as the governor, as the chief executive, and he relied on the quarantine statute. I didn't write that into the executive order, the governor did. But not once in any response, going back to last September, has the state even acknowledged that argument. They just ignore it, as if the governor didn't write that in. There's not one word of it in any of their briefs that, no, the governor disavows his power under Article 9 to issue executive orders. No, the governor disavows his power under the quarantine statute to issue a mask mandate. They don't say that. The governor doesn't say that. Instead, he, every single renewal of the executive order said the same exact thing. It said, every time he renewed his executive order, he didn't say, I just rely on the Emergency Management Act. He says, I rely on Article 9 and 23, uh, 23A, I believe, is the quarantine statute. He keeps saying that. There's no time limits to his inherent authority under Article 9. There's no time limits under the, proclam uh, the quarantine statute. The 180 days doesn't apply to that. So, there's nothing stopping the governor from tomorrow saying, under my Article 9 power, I'm reinstituting a mask mandate. Forget about, forget about emergency management. I don't need that statute. I have my own powers to do that. I think it would be, be appropriate to get one of the three things he relied on was appropriate. The court doesn't need to address whether or not he had powers under his inherent powers. But their weakness argument, Your Honor, is that he doesn't have the power under emergency management anymore. That that's been taken away by the General Assembly. They don't argue that anybody's taken away his power under Article 9 or the quarantine statute. They don't make that argument. So those two bases that were in those executive orders are still out there. They, and, they, and it is completely unanswered by the state as to what the governor's position is on those. So you're not simply trying to revoke the, the mask mandate before. You're trying to prevent the governor from doing it again? Absolutely, Your Honor. And, um, in all due respect to this governor, as I say in my brief, it's more, he's more Governor Mills than it's Governor Baker. He hasn't ended the declaration of emergency. He hasn't sent a letter to this court, as the Judge Baker did in, in Massachusetts, saying, I will not issue this type of masking mandate ever again. He doesn't say that. He says he won't do it under, under the Emergency Management Act because that power's been taken away from him. But he doesn't say I won't do it under Article 9. He doesn't say I won't do it under the quarantine statute. And he doesn't say that he won't issue a new declaration of emergency and start it all over again. Remember how we got here, Judge. There was a declaration of emergency in March of 2020. The governor ended that. I thought you were maybe giving a, a case on facts that haven't even happened yet. There's a possibility that he'll declare a new emergency. 
like, at least in his mind, a change, a health situation in the state. And that he will have another mask mandate. Isn't that a different set of facts from where we are now? We don't know what we have in the future. Judge, we know three things. You said there are two things strong in this world, death and taxes. Well, there are three things strong in this world. Death and taxes and cold and flu season. Cold and flu season is going to happen again in the fall. And this governor has signaled twice his willingness to reverse himself publicly. Remember, Your Honor, in May or June of this year, of last year, the governor dropped the masking in schools. Signaled to everyone it was over. Then all of a sudden, during the summer, kept saying, I don't have the power to issue another mask mandate under the emergency management statute. I'm not going to do it. I want the school departments to do it. I won't do it. I don't have the power to do it. And then on August 19th, he said, he changed his, did a complete 180 and said, yes, now I'm going to issue a mandate. So he's already done it once. Then he did it again. In December of this year, of last year, he issued another state of emergency and another mask mandate for businesses. What did he rely upon for that declaration in December? H3N2 uh, flu virus. So now he signaled that he has the power to declare the flu a pandemic and issue a mask mandate because of the flu. Something which has never been done before. So he's done it twice. Fool me once, shame on me. Oh, sorry, no, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on me. If there is any clear case of the possibility of a likelihood of repetition and the inability of a, of, a, of a review, this is the classic case. It will happen again, as sure as we're all sitting here. So, again, I, I see the case. I, I think the, the mootness issue, Your Honor, I don't think you don't well, see actually, it. I, I'd rather back to what you did before we go to the mootness issue, but I do want to make sure that you understand that this is a 12C motion, a motion for judgment on the pleadings, not a motion for judgment as a matter of law. And yeah. therefore, the, the court doesn't need to get to the fact that there are no material questions in dispute. It's only whether or not you would be entitled to uh, relief Uh, you're right, I agree. Of, of the original 
explain itself, um, but I think it's the same. Uh, there are no conceivable facts. You know, they're very close to one another. Yeah. So I, I, I understand that. And, and I, I would just simply point to, to your own own decision in the preliminary injunction, you weighed, you weighed facts in the case. You, but you weighed them in a way which the burden was on us at that time. A heavy burden. I think we're entitled to the normal process where we can go through discovery and have a proper hearing, full hearing, to debate those facts, to present those facts to the court. You've made that clear, and you've also made clear that you want to do this before the full seat. So what do you think about doing that? Doing the hearing for me? The trial. The trial. Uh, as soon as I can perhaps uh, get a, a, um, a motion to compel the discovery heard. Because there are, I, 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 it, there are some discovery issues that we feel should need to be straightened out. So, some, some answers to, to, to the discovery that we feel we're entitled to. Like I said, I want to get, I, I'll, I'll do that as quickly as Your Honor wants to have that done. As you, Your Honor knows, we did the motion to compel before the, the motion judge. I don't know if Your Honor would hear that or not. But, but court, actually, I'll hear whatever motion you have in this case, uh, because it may end today. But the court always appreciates it when counsel try to talk to each other about discovery issues first. So I get that. Uh, we would be more than willing, Your Honor, to have a tight, tight uh, schedule. I don't know if the state wants to conduct any discovery. Scheduling order. We'd love to have a trial this summer to get this over with. I would, we would be, my clients would be thrilled you want to get this done as quickly as possible. Let's have a summer on this case. We both have to this time. Be great. You have to, you have to represent your clients. I understand yeah. that. So, but let me shift to Mr. Field on this issue because I put you uh, on his leg, try to lay Assembly. The General Assembly can revoke a state of emergency at any time. 
And in this case, by the way, not only did they not revoke it, but on February 10th, 2022, they put their imprimatur on it. They not only said that we had this whole debate on the plumbery injunction, where, where plaintiff's counsel said the government couldn't even issue an EO that extended or related to COVID again. This court rejected that in the plumbery injunction decision in November uh, 2020, uh, 2021. But then a couple months later, the General Assembly put their imprimatur on it and not only said that the governor could do it, but they extended the state of emergency. They, they, sorry, they didn't extend the state of emergency. They didn't extinguish the state of emergency. They extended the Section E powers that were set to expire on February 10th. They extended them to the end of March. With respect to Section 13, to do all things necessary to effectively cope with disasters in the state, not inconsistent with the provisions of law. We've been through seven days of preliminary injunction, a lot of memos, a lot of papers, a lot of arguments. I have never heard the plaintiffs say that EO 2187, the mask requirement, is inconsistent with some other provision of law. They may say that the science doesn't support it. They may say that there's something out there that goes against the government's findings. They've never said what the law says. They've never said that there's something inconsistent, that EO 2187 is inconsistent with some other provision of law. Those are the facts. If there are any facts to talk about, those are the facts. That's the standard that's in the law. They want to impose on this court to weigh whose science is better, whose facts are better. That's not the standard. And even when you get into the emergency regulation, now the emergency regulation, they say we haven't talked about it. They're worried about this anxiety, the unfounded anxiety that the Supreme Court talks about, um, that, that DOH could issue the emergency regulation on its own authority. That's not what happened in this case. They want to litigate things that haven't even happened yet. What happened in this case is the governor issued EO 2187, directed DOH to issue a protocol relating to masks in schools, and DOH did. Now, even if you get into the standard that Judge Stern articulated, and I think this court adopted in this preliminary injunction with vapor technology about some plausible rationale, again, whether the governor had a plausible rationale, I don't think that that's really the standard. I think the standard is Section 13. But whether DOH had a plausible rationale in issuing the emergency regulation, well, I mean, let's just start with the fact that EO 2187 directed DOH to do so. That's a plausible rationale. This court recognized in the preliminary injunction phase that if it had nullified the emergency regulation due to the procedural posting issues, that DOH had the requirement to, to reenact the statute, reenact the emergency regulation by virtue of the EO. That's a plausible rationale right there. How about the fact that the CDC um, advised that children in school should be wearing masks? That's a plausible rationale by itself. Now, they, they're like, they don't argue with that. They don't say the CDC didn't say that. They don't say that the governor didn't direct um, DOH to do something in, in EO 2187. They say there are other things that the governor should have thought about or didn't think about. That's not the standard. That's not the standard, and the court doesn't have the power to get there. It's the legislation. The court doesn't, that's not the, yes, that's correct. The court doesn't have the power because the legislation, 20, uh, sorry, 30-15-9B with respect to the state of emergency, and then 30-15-9E13 with respect to EO 2187. Those are the, that's what articulates the standard. And even more so, the General Assembly, in your joint resolution, extended, it doesn't talk about 2187 in particular, but it, they extended all of the executive orders out another approximately six weeks to the end of March. That included EO 2187. They put their imprimatur on 2187 also. I'm sorry, 2187, uh, that's 2187. So the standards that they want this court to, to look at with respect to the facts is a lot different than what the standard is. And it's a low standard. I'm not saying there's no standard. I think that's true, Mr. Field. I understand that your um, 
your client is up or you want to preserve his power to you want to preserve his power. But isn't your argument that he no longer has the power to issue another mass mandate? At present? Without the yeah. declaration of emergency? And, and I think so I wanted to address the factual issue that you brought up first. But I do think that that gets to the mootness and justiciability issue. And, and whether or not there are factual issues in dispute, to kind of segue to the, your Honor's question, whether or not there are factual issues has no bearing in this case anymore. It might have had a bearing once in a argument. But what did counsel ask this court to do? To issue a permanent injunction. Against what? I think he just said the governor was declaring another mass mandate. There's no, to walk that through, Your Honor. Excuse me. Okay, to walk it through. The power to declare an emergency is solely within the power of the governor. Solely within the power, subject to the General Assembly. Yeah. The power to issue the mass mandate under a state of emergency, he could conceivably do that. Solely within the power of the governor. Subject to. Subject to the General Assembly in a future situation. What's before the court right now, there is no, he has no Section E powers anymore. The state of emergency that was declared in August 2186 has expired or lapsed. That is no longer in effect. The original declaration by Governor Raimondo in March 2020 is still in effect. But the governor has no Section E powers to issue an executive order under those. So there's no relief that the plaintiff, that we're in mass, I'm sorry, they have no mass in the schools right now. There's no mass requirement, at least it's from a state body. I don't think any of the cities or towns have one, but that's neither really here nor there. But he has the power to declare a state of emergency, which would give him the power to have a mass mandate. If he, he has the power to declare a state of emergency. He does. Yep. And I think it goes back to, so I guess what the court is sort of getting into is. So very quickly, if we could get back into the same situation. Well, I think the question is, is it capable of repetition and evading review? I think that's where the court's sort of going. And the answer to that question is still no. Even if, even if, and nobody knows what the future's going to hold, right? So even if there's another state of emergency, even if the governor declares another state of emergency, what the Supreme Court has said, and we cited these cases in our papers, and it was the Cranston case, it was the Sullivan v. Chafee case, not just the legal issue has to happen again, but the same factual scenario has to happen. As a matter of fact, the court was pretty particular. I think they said the particular factual scenario. And among the basis, they're not complaining about a state of emergency. They're complaining about a state of emergency that led to mass schools. And the, among the. A whole other emergency should be based on that emergency. I'm saying that their argument, their focus is on a mass requirement in schools, not the state of emergency itself. The basis of why 2187 was issued, the mass requirement for schools back in August, was among the reasons that were articulated was because there was no vaccine that was available for children. That scenario will not repeat itself. Could there be another state of emergency? There could. Could there be whatever scenarios happen in the future? There could. But will there be a requirement for mass in schools? The other one was based largely on the fact that there was no, there was no vaccine that was available for children. That was the concern. So practically speaking, Mr. Southfield, this is a change of facts all the time. Mr. Southfield will never have an opportunity to obtain a permanent injunction. We're having a hearing. I'm not sure I understand. Because the facts will always change. The emergency will always change. Treatment will always change. And because of all this motion, nothing's going to be the same as the facts that were originally assessed. This domino. Prong two, we're going to have overprong 16 by the time we get to trial. That'd be new. 
He has to be a booster 16. I don't think that I would put it that way, Judge. The, the dominant reason for the mask requirement, 2187, was because children were not eligible for a vaccine. That was the dominant reason. It's, it's in 2187. There's only a couple findings of fact that were in 2187. The dominant one um, was that children weren't eligible for a vaccine. That will never be a part of The vaccine's available. Given the anomaly of the issue and how it affected everyone, a state of emergency that affected all of the states by million people, shouldn't there be some guidance from the court as to whether or not it was effective and should be effective? I think what you're, you're getting to the justiciability issue and whether or not there should be guidance in the future based on these facts that will not reoccur. There won't be another situation where children are not eligible for a vaccine, for a COVID-19 vaccine. They're presenting this court with an abstract question. And I mean, we've talked about mootness, we've talked about, you know, exception to mootness, but when they're asking this court for, I think what this court is sort of inviting is, is, it, is an abstract advisory opinion. It goes back to the real articulable relief that they can get from this court. The court has, the court's been very clear, the Supreme Court has been very clear that if they don't present actual articulable relief, if the Superior Court can't, pres can't present that, the Superior Court has no jurisdiction. It's not a question of exception, it's a question of subject matter jurisdiction. They have to present- The court does have the ability to, to issue declaratory judgments, determining the power of the different people, the power of a contract, the power of the state agencies, correct? When, when, correct your honor, subject to an immediate or, or imminent issue or, or, or present issue, they're not looking for an imminent or present issue. They're asking this court to go back and declare what happened a year ago to be unlawful. That's not a present issue that's before the court. The court doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction over that. Now, if, if uh, counsel tried to bring up the, um, the mass mandate with respect to, to airplanes um, and, and travel, I mean, that was a requirement that was going on. So the federal court was able to issue a declaratory judgment in that case. It had real articulable relief. The real articulable relief was to declare the, the, um, the mass requirement um, or to enjoin the, the mass requirement. That's not, what's, that's not what's going on here. There is no mass requirement. This court, has, this court can't issue any injunctive relief. I would direct the court to uh, Lamb versus Perry, uh, 225 Atlantic 2nd at 524. It's in our reply memo. And I've got a, a quote from it. Um, right at the end of the opinion, what the Supreme Court said was that the plaintiff's request for declaratory relief, quote, goes to their rights, status, or other, re or other relations. I'm sorry. The, goes not to their rights, status, or other legal relations, but rather to the past conduct. It is a question to be directed not to the courts, but to the electorate. And that's the real problem I've got with what the relief is that they're looking for. They're not looking for any present relief. They come up with hypotheticals that are not before the court about the flu, or cold season, or another, pan another variant. None of those issues are before the court. They're entirely speculative. A year ago, governments were imposing... Isn't what he's asking is, could this mass mandate that happened in 2021 that affected these people in 2020, which is not well in the other place, and look at that situation, determine whether or not it was right or wrong, whether or not the governor had the power to issue that mandate, right or wrong, and that that, if the court issues a declaratory judgment on that, Regardless of the request for injunctive relief, that that could serve as a guidance to whether or not consultable children would be required to wear a mask in 2023. I think the answer to that is no. 
Because again, it goes back to what one of the dominant circumstances were in August of 2021, which is that children weren't able to be vaccinated. That situation will never reoccur. There's a vaccine out there. That situation about, about the foundation, about uh, underlying what 2187 was issued upon will never reoccur again. And, and again, I direct the court to Sullivan versus Chafee, the, the Cranston case that, that are cited in our memos. And the court talks about, in fact, Sullivan versus Chafee, um, that was a circumstance where it was the fiscal year 1997 budget. And, and the argument by the plaintiffs in Sullivan was, well, there's going to be a budget every year. I mean, I mean if, if anything's going to happen every year, it's a budget. There's going to be a budget every year. And they wanted the court to issue declaratory judgment about what had happened when the, when the budget was issued, whether that was uh, issued properly or the guidance that your honors referenced. And, then, and I believe when it was in the Superior Court, fiscal year, but fiscal year 97 had not expired, so, so, so the Superior Court issued a declaration. It went up to the Supreme Court. By the time it got to the Supreme Court, fiscal year 97 had closed. And the Supreme Court very particularly says those circumstances that, that underline what happened um, with that declaration will not reoccur. And again, it's a subject matter jurisdiction issue. Now? No, for a different reason. So in Bailey's, in, in, 
or midpoint segment, but in Bailey's, uh, the underlying state of emergency still existed. I think it was Governor Mills, I think. Yeah. Uh, the, the underlying state of emergency still existed in, Bailey, in the Bailey's case. The governor still had the authority to issue executive orders. In Boston Fit Labs, and, and I'll read directly from the case, it's actually, looks like it's the last substantive paragraph in Boston Fit Labs at page 11 and 12. The situation in Bailey's is different from ours, however. That is because here, i.e. in Bailey's and Boston Fit Labs, unlike in Bailey, the offending order is gone along with the COVID-19 state of emergency. In, in Bailey's, the underlying state of emergency existed. Governor Mills could still issue an executive order. In Boston Fit Labs, Governor Baker had, had voluntarily rescinded his state of emergency. And therefore, his power to issue executive orders had been voluntarily also rescinded. And he also indicated, I think, <clears throat> that it was unfair to treat an arcade differently from a casino. They're pretty, they're pretty similar anyway, and I don't know why we did it that way, and it's not going to be done again. In typical uh, government fashion, it's not going to be done again. And that was somewhat uh, credible to the, to the circuit court. Yeah, yeah, I know the two cases can be read together because. There is an overlap of your judge on each of the two panels. So I'm not sure it's Judge Selly, who I am sure uh, thought there was consistency between the two cases. Yep. Um, in the Mills case, uh, that was a case where the governor did something somewhat more drastic, placing a casino, in, placing a, giving a casino preferential treatment over an arcade. In Bailey's campground, you prohibited all out of state visitors, correct? Uh, I think that was the fast pass. Judge, here, here's the distinguishing factor between the two cases. And Boston Bit Labs expressly says this is the distinguishing factor. In Bailey's, while the executive order had been rescinded, the governor still had the power to reissue the executive order. Or, or an executive order. In Boston Bit Labs, Governor Baker voluntarily rescinded the state of emergency, and therefore he couldn't issue any more executive orders. Now, the plaintiffs say, in this case, Governor McKee didn't write a letter to the court saying, you know, he's not going to issue another, um, you know, executive order or whatever it might be. What happened, to, the reason why this is like Boston Bit Labs is because by operation of law, the governor's Section E powers have expired. He can't issue another another executive order under his powers under his under 3015-9E. He can't do it. I I would make that representation to the court. I talked to the governor's executive council last night. But it's still a healthcare. I'm not going to say there's a pandemic because it's even question of that. It's still a healthcare crisis going on, correct? I I don't know if there's a, I I don't know how to answer that. I mean, there's still. There's still a, I don't know if crisis is the right word or not. It might be, might, I think reasonable minds can differ on that. But there's a healthcare situation going on. That COVID's not, COVID-19 still exists. Which could flare up again. It could flare up again. And the governor could therefore issue another state of emergency and another mask I, I think the way your honor posed that question, with all due respect, answers the question. COVID-19 could flare up again. It could, or it could not. Governor McKee could issue another mass requirement. He could, or he could not. Those are all the hypothetical questions that the plaintiffs are asking this court to stay on. One of the cases talks about staying on thin ice. That's where this court is, that's where they're asking this court to go. He could, or he could not. But those, those situations, what may or may not happen in the future, some of those are entirely hypothetical and, and unknown. Others of them, such as not, being, not having a vaccine for children, that, that, that is known. That will never occur again. So, in Bailey's campground, I believe that Governor Mills is the one who we actually revoked it after the Federal District Court case. Was 
the circuit court said, quote, nothing in the record suggests the governor rescinded the litigation-related reason. Close quote. Uh, rather, the conditions changed. A quote, the dynamic notice, I'm sorry, the dynamic nature of both the virus that has given rise to this pandemic and the public health response to it, all but ensures close quote that the situation may be repeated. There, as here, the situation will be repeated again. No, because in Bailey's campground, the governor still had the authority to issue an executive order. Well, doesn't the governor here have the power to one declare a state of emergency and two issue? The governor would have to issue another state of emergency subject to the General Assembly non-termination um, or subject to their termination. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I can't tell them there, there was no state of, there was no, the governor re rescinded the order in Bailey's. He would have to issue another order in order to get the case up again. It's simply a question of whether or not it's likely to be repeated. Bailey's, they would have to issue another order. But the authority existed in present place for, for, their, for the government to issue that executive order. This is Boston Midlands. The underlying state of emergency is gone. There's another quote from Bailey's in 2058. Thus, we cannot say that the governor has carried the formidable burden that she bears. Showing that it is absolutely clear that the alleged wrongful behavior could not reasonably be expected to occur. Close quote. So the state needs to establish that there's no likelihood that this could ever be occur, that he would ever issue another executive order on that. Judge, I, I guess I'll see your Bailey's quote and I'll raise you a, a Boston Big quote, if I may. Um, at page 10, what your honor just said to me is, I have the formidable burden to show that the governor could never issue another executive order. Page 10 of Midlabs says that the governor has the power to issue executive orders cannot itself be enough to skirt mootness because then no suit against the government would ever be moot. That's not the standard. The standard is not whether or not there's some new authority out there that the governor couldn't redeclare a state of emergency. That's what Boston Midlap says. You have to read the two consistently. I think we, we, we agree on that. If Judge Shelley can find a way to do it, I'll do it somehow. Um, but, but again, I think it also comes back to the, the real articulable relief that the plaintiffs are asking this court to, to grant. And there's no real articulable relief. They want the court to declare something that happened a year ago unlawful. They can't enjoin it. The court can't enjoin it because it's already happened. It, it, it's already been, um, the executive orders have already lapsed. There's no, there's no requirement, um, no state requirement that children in schools wear masks. So they're asking for this court to grant right relief. What's that? Right now. That's true. How long did they have to wear a mask for? How the pool this all the time? It was from, um, well, it would have been the beginning of the school year to March 4th. Judge, I understand. I, people in this courthouse have to wear, wear masks. Nobody enjoyed that. We talked about that in chambers. This is the first, you know, other than the preliminary injunction, this is the first in court hearing I've had in two years. You've got the justices on the Supreme Court. Nobody's been in that courtroom other than them for two years. This has changed the way everything has happened. There's no question about it. Thank you. I've interrupted you several times. Are you all set? I think so. I mean, if the court has any further questions, I, I guess I just keep, keep going back to the real articulable relief 
and the standard that has to be met on the DJ. And it's not just some question, you know, Your Honor kind of pointed this out earlier, it's not just declaring rights that people want this court to declare. It's um, the, the, the actual law. Uh, this is from McKenna, 874, and then we second, 227. The Declaratory Judgment Act is a vehicle by which parties can obtain relief for actual or imminent harm. That's not what's here. They want this court to declare relief based on past conduct, and that's Lamb versus Perry. <clears throat> And in fact, it kind of talks about the constituent parts of, just, of a justiciability claim, and one of them is, quote, some legal hypothesis which will entitle the plaintiff to real and articulable relief. They have done that. They can't do that.
emergency regulation is appropriate or not. You Otherwise, mean, you mean the governor does. No, the court does. Uh, let, me, let me argue this way. As a big technologies, if the governor has done nothing here, kind of like he did in the um, vaccine for healthcare workers, there was never an executive order for vaccines for healthcare workers in the state. Instead, the Department of Health issued an emergency regulation. Independent of the governor's power, and they issued, they issued it under that emergency regulation statute. As time went on, what did the Department of Health do during that 180 day period? They conducted a cost benefit analysis. They reviewed the effectiveness of a, mass, of a vaccine mandate for healthcare workers. And as, I, as your honor knows from another case where I cited the new regulation, guess what? They decided after they did the cost benefit analysis to do away with the vaccine mandate. I asked Dr. McDonald, I don't know how many times on the stand I tried to get out of it. Why are you not doing the same cost benefit analysis for the last mandate? Oh, we don't have enough time. Well, but at the same time, they were doing it for the vaccine mandate. Uh, Your Honor, I never got around to fully citing Health Freedom Defense Fund versus Biden. April 18, 2022. Decision from Middle District of Florida. Judge Menzel. It was because of this decision, I got to fly up here from Tampa last week without a mask on in an airplane. With about 95% of the other plane, of the other people on the plane not wearing a mask. Because of this decision. What did this decision find? It found that the CDC failed to properly conduct the normal regulatory process, the normal notice and comment period regarding mask mandates on airplanes. Gee, isn't that the argument I've been saying for the last six months here? And your honor. And there is no notice and comment period for emergency regulation. It's this it's, is an emergency, let's enact it, and then we're going to have a permanent regulation. And the, and the federal government argued there's a good cause exception under, under the federal ADA. There's a good cause exception that says you don't have to go through notice and comment if it's an emergency. And that's, that was the federal government's argument. And how did Judge Menzel answer that? The CDC's failure to explain its reasoning is problematic here. At the time the CDC issued the mandate, the COVID pandemic had been ongoing for almost a year. The timing undercuts the CDC's suggestion that its action was so urgent that the 30-day comment period was contrary to the public interest. August 19, 2021, Department of Health issues an emergency regulation. COVID pandemic had been going on for a year and a half. Exactly what Judge Mazzella said. What else did she say? The failure to explain is especially troubling because the benefits of public comment were at their zenith. The mandate governs the conduct of private individuals in their daily life. Heightened interest in, in participating in a regulation that would constrain their choices and actions via threats of simple and criminal penalties. She drew the distinction that I have been trying to argue to your honor. Vapor Technologies was about selling flavored vape pens. Who cares? How does that affect people's everyday lives? It's meaningless. You give great deference to the Department of Health or something stupid like that. You don't give them great deference when they force you little kids to wear masks in school, causing them, as your honor said, irreparable harm for months. And by the way, complete silence from the state as to your finding about irreparable harm. They still, the state still takes the position that, you're, that there's no harm to kids wearing masks. If that's not a signal that they're willing to do it again, I don't know what is. Some other factual points I think are important to make. My brother keeps saying the sole basis, or almost the sole basis, for the mask mandate was that kids can't be vaccinated. Lie. Wrong. Read the, the two executive orders. Yes, they mentioned vaccines. They also mentioned the 
the recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics. They mentioned that the CDC guidance, yes, you are. The CDC guidance still says wear masks in schools. They didn't say that that was so based, it's they said that now the situation has significantly changed by the availability of the vaccine. Okay. And what the situation may not be. And, and, and we also know you're not going to help us in the I'm sorry. And then what the situation may not be repeated, the argument now would be different. That, that is just such a ludicrous argument, Ron. I'm sorry. Does anyone honestly believe that? We already are hearing that the vaccine efficacy is waning. We are on our second booster. Those boosters, I don't know that they've been approved for children yet. So very likely in September, the state, relying on CDC guidance, could say, those original vaccines are practically worthless. Even natural immunity, 75% of students, as I understand it, have already have natural immunity now. Well, that doesn't matter either, because that wanes. Dr. McDonald testified, 90 days it wanes. So now you have a vaccine. You have a booster. Well, what happens when the booster efficacy wanes? Can you see the, how that executive order is going to read in September? Having quote, by the way, the March 20, March 9, 2020 executive order is still in existence. It hasn't gone away. The governor hasn't revoked it. He could have, but he didn't. He's still declaring that we're under a COVID state of emergency. He could very easily issue a new executive order in September that says, due to the waning efficacy of vaccines, and due to the fact that school-aged children now are not eligible for their first or second booster, we're going to have to reimpose a mask in. I mean, do, you, does, do we seriously think that that's not a likely possibility? Of course it is. To sit, to stand here and argue yeah, that, oh, the possibility that the governor could issue an executive order on anything. I don't know it's, whether it's a probability, but a possibility. And in every situation, Mr. Klein, Mr. Fields just indicated that his, the ability to question that is in the hands of the legislature because they can come back and limit the ability to issue, limit the executive's ability to issue an emergency order. We all know how long and difficult it is for the General Assembly first to reconvene when they're already out of session in September. They waited until they reconvened in January to even take this up. This time they did. This time they did. Um, the governor indicated in his papers that he has the power to veto the current resolution, so we need a supermajority to overturn an executive order. And again, I gave the state yet a third, a fourth, a fifth opportunity to address my argument. The governor, in his executive order, cites virtue of my authority as governor pursuant to Article 9 of the Constitution and the general laws, including Title 30, Chapter 15, and Title 23A. And he repeated that in every executive order. He revived in September of 2021 when he renewed the, first, uh, the, the, the August uh, executive order. He says, whereas on March 9th, executive order 2002 was issued declaring a state of emergency. That's still in existence. I haven't heard an argument from the state that the 180-day time limit on an executive order for masking pursuant to 2002 has been prohibited by the General Assembly. Their argument is Executive Order 2186 was terminated. The new declaration for the new Delta variant. There is no clear indication from the governor that he doesn't believe he has the power under 2002 to issue a new mask mandate. They haven't, the state has not made that clear. I have not heard that argument. The state has not made it clear that the governor will not invoke Article 9 of the Constitution or will not invoke 23E, the quarantine statute. He cites it in his, in his executive order. Again, he doesn't just cite the Emergency Powers Act. So, 
I do this, Your Honor. My brother cites tax cases, budget cases. Budgets change every year. That's right. The Supreme Court doesn't want courts in those types of cases. He cites a case from 1967, the land case involving a budget process. By the way, there are cases that are cited. There are other cases where the Supreme Court has allowed the challenges that go beyond the current budget year. I can think of the case involving school funding, where the Supreme Court, the Cranston School Committee case, I was involved in, where school budgets violated, were run at a deficit, which was a violation of state law. The Supreme Court took those cases up without argument. So we're not talking about tax cases. We're not talking about tax cases where the standing is questionable, as in the McKenna v. Judge Williams case, where then when Attorney McKenna was trying to argue he was under roving prosecution, he had the power to bring a full round to us to the legality of the Chief Justice to sit as a Supreme Court Justice. Those cases are totally different to what we're talking about here. Nobody was arguing that Justice Williams sitting as a Supreme Court Justice was causing irreparable harm to children in schools. And I'll just one last point, which I will leave it at this. Unlike these other cases, it is a very important issue. There's a compulsory attendance law in Rhode Island, 1619-1, which makes it a crime for a parent not to send their kids to school. The only exceptions are if you send the kids to private school or an approved homeschooling program. I don't think it takes much for this court to understand that not all parents are like the Southwells that have the luxury, the money, the time to homeschool their children or to send them to a private school. They're forced by law to send them to a public school. And by sending them to public school, their children are being forced to wear a mask. And if they don't send them to public school, they don't have the option, like the Supreme Court has, of sitting back and conducting hearings by video. They have to attend in person. And if they don't, they're subject to fines. This is not some vague fear. These are serious, serious issues. And I would hope this court would give us that opportunity to flesh that out more. Thank you. Just to make the record very, very clear, Your Honor, the executive order of the state of emergency 20-02, I can say in my papers that the governor doesn't have any power under Section B that the 180 days applies to the state of emergency that's in effect 20-02. It's on page 7 or 8 of my reply brief, but I'll say it again right here. The budget amendment that was passed in 2021 limiting the Section B executive order to 180 days applies to Executive Order 2186, the one that was issued in August 2021, and then applies to the March 2020 executive order, state of emergency issued by Governor Raimondo. 180 days from the date of both of those states of emergencies has elapsed. And I can tell you, and I had this conversation last night with the governor's executive counsel just to make sure we're on the same page, that the governor does not believe that he has any power to issue an executive order under Section B that would expire pursuant to both of those states of emergencies. Just to kind of put out there also why that state of emergency still exists, under the statute, the governor has the authority to issue a state of emergency not just for when the state of emergency is in effect, but also before and sort of the cleanup effect, the end of it. Just by way of an example, a snowstorm or a hurricane, the state of emergency doesn't end with the last snowflake. There's things that have to be done and have to be completed, and that's why we're still in the 20-20, the March 2020 state of emergency, to sort of clean up and finish with, my understanding is that there's some reimbursement that has to be done, and that's why we're here. Thank you. Thank you.
first issues, there's other issues out there. Um, the state gets funding for non congregate care. Whenever the reasons for that state of emergency, they are not to issue an executive order under 3015 9 um, I, I, I'm sorry to hear that because the governor's legal counsel says they won't, the governor's says they won't, because there's a regulation that says they won't. Well, I think, I think probably all of us think state law says that they won't. This court's preliminary injunction, I mean, that's what we had argued. We had argued, you know, state law was 180 days from the state of emergency. This court said that in its preliminary injunction, and the governor's executive council agrees with that. So I think it's probably all three of us. I'm just trying to think of how this last issue is going to be resolved. The little issue, the issue is it likely to be repeated again? So I'm sorry? Is, is the situation likely to be repeated again? I'm trying to figure out the rules. I think the answer to that is no. I mean, the, the Boston Bit Labs is, again, I'll go back to the page 10 quote that I, that, that I gave to your honor. <coughs> Just because the governor has the authority to issue a state of emergency or an executive order, that's not enough to evade review according to the First Circuit, according to Bit Labs. So, you know, and, and, and even, if, even if it's possible that there's some future state of emergency out there, we're talking about the particular fact situation. And, and, and again, we just heard through the argument of counsel again, you know, well, this could happen and that could happen. That's not the standard. It just isn't. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to respond to was, and, and I may have just heard it, but I thought I heard that the governor indicated that he can veto a joint resolution unless it's passed by a supermajority. I don't know if any other way that. I've never heard that. It is definitely not in the brief, I'll tell you that. But if you're on in your initial letter reply to our motion back in September of 2021. I've never seen, and I don't know of any authority where the governor can veto a joint resolution and the state of emergency. I would be shocked if I said that. So if the court has any other questions, I'm happy to address them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I just want to provide you with a copy of the federal case. I don't know that it's on this morning. Larry? Yeah, it's on. Sure, thank you. There are some highlights on it. Thank you. You're welcome. The question we reserve for the committee complicates the question here, so we just get through this. However, as you call it, not my court, not in your court anymore, come up with an answer to the question. Discovery should therefore hold, correct? Your Honor, the agreement with the parties was that we would wait for the court's decision. Judge, I said that. I presume Your Honor would be prompt with this decision, as you often are. But given what you've asked today, I don't think we can forestall discovery if the court wants it to continue. If Your Honor wants us to continue with discovery, I would like to file a motion to compel. If Your Honor will hear that, I would do that within a week. Your Honor, I think we, as Your Honor just alluded to, there's some difficult questions. We'd ask the court to go through those difficult questions, answer them in a traditional way, and then the parties can go with it and then let it out. What's the harm in going forward with discovery? There's a suit pending. Someone wants discovery. It's my answer. We've got to get to the end of this case one way or another. Judge, we think that we have gotten to the end of this case. But it was a preliminary injunction, correct? I'm not even talking about the preliminary injunction. I'm talking about today. I'm talking about today. I'm talking about the mootness, the justiciability, and the factual standards, the standards that have to be applied. So, and I'm going to re-argue that. We've just spent, you know, X hours or X time doing that. 
the harm in doing that is that the amount of discovery in this case is going to be large. It's going to be, it's going to involve privileges. We're going to end up very possibly with other cert petitions. Your Honor saw, I don't have it in front of you, but Your Honor saw one of the, uh, the very first question about, um, and, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it in front of me, but, you know, what did the Department of Health tell the governor and um, what did the governor rely on and what discussions did people have with the governor? Even Your Honor said it was, you know, it certainly wasn't before the court, you know, as it would be for a motion, um, but they very clearly implicate privilege issues. So that's number one. So the amount of discovery to us is going to be quite voluminous. And frankly, the amount of discovery that's going to go the other way. There's 30 plus plaintiffs. So the amount of discovery going the other way is going to be equally voluminous. Well, because the parties would agree that I'll comment that. 